three times in John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, that great miracle that Jesus did, he then correlates that with this statement three times. I am the bread of life. I am that living bread which came down. I am that true bread. I am the bread of life. This is the point that he's making. And the difficulty that others begin to, to have and the confusion that they begin to have because of the statement. We know his parents. We know we, we've seen him grow up. How is it the case that he says that he's come down from heaven? How is it the case that he's stay, making this statement, I am that bread from heaven? Our fathers had manna in the wilderness. They look back in the history of the Israelites and they go, we had this previously. We, we had all this. We understand this. But how is it that this man says that He's the bread of life. How is it that he says he has come down from heaven? That he's the one, that true bread sent from heaven. Sent from, in fact, the Father. Makes that connection. And there are many of those Jewish leaders who will have difficulty with that. But there are others because they stir up the crowd. And the conversation then becomes. Jesus turns it and he says, you have to be accepting of that. In fact, would, would teach a very hard and difficult lesson. The point of... It's time to make a commitment to me as such. And he's going to make the statement, you have to eat my flesh and drink of my blood. And he's talking about take on the whole of the teaching of Christ. His words that are in fact life. And then there will be those who will turn away from him. Who will walk no more with him in fact. And as such... We soon see that he turns to his disciples and he says, will you go away as well? We find this in John chapter 6, verses 60 through 69. And that question is asked there in verse 8. Do you also want to go away? There are plenty of people who are walking away right now. Do you also want to walk away from me? And so now, while he has that crowd in front of him, he's, he's made this difficult teaching but he's made the point that you've got to be accepting of that, that you've got to make a commitment, in fact, to me. And now then turns inward to his apostles, his closest of his disciples, and asks the same question. Will you also go away? It's time to make a decision, right? It's time to make a commitment. Well, we might ask that question, and we're going to do so this morning. To whom shall we go? Who are we going to go? And that's the question, or that's the answer, in fact, that Peter gives. You have the words of eternal life. Who else would we possibly go to at this point in time? But I understand. We look around. We understand there are many smart folks in the world today. People turn to them for, for answers. People will, will naturally follow those individuals who especially are very charismatic. In their ways, they typically draw a lot of people to them because of their, their natural abilities to talk in front of people and to, to encourage people. And so they draw a lot of people into them. To whom shall we go? And even 2,000 years later, the answer is very, very much the same. Jesus, you have the words of life. Who else would we go to? That's the point of our lesson this morning. You see, as a soldier, as a soldier of Christ, isn't that what the Apostle Paul would write to Timothy? He says, endure hardness, endure the, the difficulties of this life as if you were a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That idea of being a soldier. And we understand that it's, it's on a volunteer basis. We sign up for this. We begin to follow Jesus. And he is, in fact, the captain, the captain of our Salvation. We'll notice that verse in just a moment. But I want you to look with me in Ephesians chapter 6. And I want us to notice together what is stated there about putting on the whole armor of God. He talks about being a soldier. What does that look like in our lives? Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to back all the way up to verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. In this life, to whom shall we go when we need strength. We go to Christ. He is the captain of our salvation, made perfect through 
suffering. We'll learn in just a moment in Hebrews chapter 2. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We wrestle not, he said, or put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. And this is important because he said, you need to be strong. And this got me thinking about years ago, way back when. I wasn't a soldier, I was a sailor. But nonetheless, we stood at attention. We, we stood on the, the parade ground, if you will, sometimes hours on end. What would it take to stand? Because, you know, the first thing I tell you is, okay, you're going to be out there for a while. But don't lock your knees. And somebody would eventually lock their knees and you'd see them just right over backwards. And the problem is that you can't move, even when that's going on around you. You just hope he doesn't tower over a timber into you and, uh, and, and mess you up. You have to stand there at attention, and, and it's going to take some doing because you're standing there a long time. But we're there waiting for orders from, in fact, our captain, the one who's in charge of us. And Jesus is trying to teach us as his soldiers, as he is our captain, Hebrews 2 that we, in fact, waiting for orders from him, but we also find our strength in him. How many times was it the case that, that we would hear a, a, a message, something stirring, something riveting to get us kind of pumped up for the moment to, to give us the, the strength that we needed to, to go on and do whatever the next task was that next hour or the next day, whatever the case was. We'd get up that morning and, and here's what we're going to do. Here's our orders for the day. We could read that off, and now we're in line. This is what we're going to do, and let's march forward, and let's take on the task of the day. But it wasn't always the case that it was on our own strength. And I know we were being built up to, to be strong, but we soon realized that we're not being strong by ourselves. We're being strong with one another, those that are around us, but then also being strong because we're following those orders that have been given. Those are the things that are right for us to be doing, and therefore we move forward. Well, it's the same with Christ, because Paul is saying you need to be strong, not in yourself, but in the Lord, following His orders. Why? So that you put on that whole armor of God that you can stand. So that you can stand all day if you're told to do so. So that you can stand in, in, in the midst of the fiery darts of the wicked one. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Take on, he says again, the whole armor of God. You've got to be prepared for this. Why? So that you can stand, withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. We've got to stand up. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, we have to continue and maintain that stance if you will. And so he says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of the saints. All those things that he's mentioning there, it lends itself to that idea of that soldier, how he's ready for battle, ready for the order to be given to march forward, to take that step forward. And if need be, to stand as a wall, if you will, to be able to stand up against the wiles and the trickery and the deceit of the father of lies, that wicked one, the devil. And so as a soldier, we go to Christ because he is our captain. And there's Hebrews 2 and verse 10 that reminds us it was fitting for him or befitting him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. He's the creator that's mentioned in there. But we also see the purpose of such in bringing many sons to glory and to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And then Paul would again write to Timothy, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself again with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now again, I mentioned a moment ago, this is a volunteer army in which we serve. 
This is a volunteer basis. But we've essentially seen the posters around town, if you will. You know, the, the old picture, you know, Uncle Sam wants you was the idea that, that for so many times that, that battle cry, your country needs you in that way. But God is saying, I want you, as we studied last week, and so he has made a way that we can be enlisted in his army as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, enduring the afflictions of this life. To whom shall we go? We go to our captain, Christ. As a member of the body of Christ, I soon realize that, that I have to look for the head because he is in fact the one in charge once again. Romans 12, I'm reminded, verse 4 and 5, as we have many members in one body, and that's a beautiful thought, isn't it? The one body of Christ. And, and we begin to realize that all those who are in Christ are many members in that one body. And he's making the point about those spiritual gifts and some of those things. He says we do not have the same function as such, but we being many are one body in Christ. Individually, he says we're members of one another. And again, promotes that, that idea of a family. Well, every family has a head. Everybody has a head. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? His body. And so we read in Colossians 1 verse 18 that he is in fact the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead, he says, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he in all things might have the preeminence. Why? Because he's the head. He deserves and requires that preeminence. And so we give him that glory spot of preeminence. Ephesians 1, Paul would say never, nearly the same thing. He's put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, or continues to fill all in all. And in Ephesians chapter 1, such a beautiful thought is, is given there in talking about the unity that's had and the position of Christ as the head over the church, that in all things we might enjoy the fullness of Him. The fullness of Him. Again, that idea, that unity, but also the privileges, those blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, being a member of His body which he is, in fact, head. To whom shall we go? We go to the head, who is Christ. As a sinner, I soon realize that I, I've sinned against God. There is a need that I have because of sin, because I am now separated from God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 and verse 9 reminds us in that same uh, scripture passage as well. But then we look at 1 John chapter 1, written to Christians, and he says, If we say that we have no sin, Christians, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So both to the one who's never obeyed the gospel, as a sinner, I have to come to a knowledge of my Redeemer. Think back to the Old Testament in Job 19. And it's Job who cries out, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Right? We sing that often. I know that he lives. We see even David would make a similar statement. Oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. He knew to whom he should go for his strength, for salvation. When David did sin with Bathsheba, we read of his penitent psalm in Psalm 51, and we read the statements that he makes. Cleanse me again. Make me to know the joy of salvation once again. And I'm paraphrasing that, but in Psalm 51, we see the heart of David, a penitent heart, one who is, is, is contrite and broken down, one who realizes his sin that, that he has done against God and wants nothing more and to have that strength once again of his Redeemer. And so he says, let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Peter says, 
knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your aimless conduct, he says, received by tradition of your fathers, but so it wasn't those things that perish. It wasn't those things that get passed away. It wasn't silver and gold. It wasn't those things that are going to be burned up in the end, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's how we in fact were redeemed and can be redeemed through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Would you turn with me and read this whole section in Titus chapter 2 beginning of verse 11. Titus 2 verse 11 down through verse 14. Paul writes to Titus he says the grace of God hath appeared to all men Teaching us or instructing us, the American Standard says, instructing us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age and present world, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. But watch what Jesus did for us, Paul says, who gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us, that he might be our redeemer from all iniquity. To purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What a beautiful thought when you think about our Redeemer. The fact that he does truly live, as we sang just a moment ago. And we know that through the Scripture. We have that foundation of truth. Thy word is truth, Jesus says in John 17, 17. And therefore we can know the Redeemer. We can know that we're in fact redeemed. I don't have to second guess. I don't have to doubt. I don't have to worry about those things. I can know that I know that I know. And 1 John was written, I think, for that very reason, for us to have that kind of confidence and assurance in Jesus Christ. I can know that I have eternal life by the things, in fact, that are written. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. So I can know my Redeemer. To whom shall we go to be redeemed? Only to Christ. When I think about praying, when I think about as a Christian in my life and, and, and in my responsibility to be praying, there's a way that's been made possible. And I have an intercessor. To whom should we go to be my intercessor? To whom should we go to, to have one who would stand in between us and the Father? That's Christ. And so as a praying Christian, and Jesus taught, he spoke in a parable, in fact, for this purpose or to this end that men ought to always pray and not to give up or not to faint. Paul says it this way, to pray without ceasing. That's what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to have that way that we can, in fact, pray unto the Father, that we can make our petitions known unto him. And in fact, as an intercessor, he knows both parties and he knows this very well. He knows, certainly, the Father. And he knows how to relay that situation back to us because he has also been man. And so he knows the feeling of our infirmities, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Why? So that we may boldly come under the throne of grace to ask for help in a time of need. As a praying Christian, Christ is my intercessor. And so we read that wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8 and come to verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. He knows our plight. He knows our difficulties. And in fact, then when we pray, he is the one through whom. We pray unto the Father. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 7 verse 25. He is able to save them to the uttermost. And those who come to God through him. Seeing or since he always lives to make intercession for them. What a beautiful passage in thinking about the blessing that we have of an intercessor. To whom shall we go who stands before us, before the Father, who stands between us, who, who will make my petitions known unto the Father? 
That's Christ. And makes that even possible that I could, in fact, go to the Father in prayer. To whom shall we go as an intercessor? Only to Christ. As sheep. Sheep who the prophet Isaiah says have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned away. And Jesus, in teaching the parable of the, uh, the, the 99 who were saved, who were safe, but one, you remember, went away. The shepherd went after that one. Why would he do so? Well, because he's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Jesus, when he looked at the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and they were scattered about like sheep, having no shepherd. To whom shall we go as sheep? We go to the good shepherd. For you were like sheep going astray, Peter says, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer or bishop of your souls. One who's watching, in fact, then for our souls. In John chapter 10, we find Jesus making the point about being the good shepherd. And what is it that makes him good? He gives his life for his sheep. He's not like the hireling who at the first sign of trouble would run off because they don't belong to him anyway. He's not going to lose his life on behalf of those. But the good shepherd will stand. You hear that? Will stand for you. Will fight for you. Give his life for you. Good shepherd. Hebrews 13 verse 20 closes in this fashion. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep. The great shepherd. He refers to himself as the good shepherd. But the Hebrews writer says the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Look at Psalm 23. Typically we refer to this as what? The shepherd's song, right? That's that. So the world knows this is the shepherd's song. And we see it this way because the Lord is my shepherd. Look at the personal nature of it. And David writes this, and I shall not want. He's going to provide all things that I need. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So he, he brings me to those green pastures where, where I have all that I need. He's providing everything. He, he takes me beside still waters. Sheep are skittish. They, they don't want fast running water, but beside the still water, they can drink. They will drink. And they're provided those things. He says, He restores my soul, leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, He says, I'll fear no evil. Thou art with me, thy rod and my staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To whom shall we go? The great shepherd of the sheep. I love that phrase. My cup continues to run over. It continues to run over. With all that he's provided, with all that he has blessed us with, it continues to run over. To whom shall we go as sheep? We go to the great shepherd, Jesus Christ himself. We come to the T in Christ. I hope you've picked up on that by now. As a disciple, as a student, as a learner, as a follower, I come to the master teacher. I come to the rabbi. Great rabbi. I come to the master teacher. In fact, King James used the word Rabboni. The idea he is the master teacher. He is the one who has excelled. But it's interesting because there will be those who will notice his teaching. And they'll make sense. How is it that this man knows all of this? Where's the letters to follow his name? Where's the doctorate? Where's the Ph.D.? You may not realize this, but I, too, have a Ph.D. It's called post-hole digging. I grew up that way, and, and, and 
you can get yourself one of those degrees pretty cheap as well if you want to put up a fence. Get you a post hole digging degree. But anyway, my point is that when they looked at Jesus, they saw him as, as just, a, just a common man. We, we know his father. We, he's just the carpenter's son. He works with his hands. He's not skilled with his mind. He hasn't studied the law. He hasn't sat at the feet of Gamaliel and the other doctors of the law. Where's his letters? But what does Nicodemus pick up on? In John chapter 3, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, he's a ruler of the Jews, the same came by night to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know. We know. He didn't say, we're trying to figure this out. We got some questions. Well, we're, we're not real sure. He says, we know. That's confidence, isn't it? We know that you are a teacher, come from God. No one. There's not a single person, no man can do these miracles that you're doing except God be with him. You, teacher, come from God. If we want to learn, if we want to be students, to whom do we go? We go to Christ, who is the master teacher. In Matthew chapter 7, 28, 29, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings. The people were astonished at his doctrine. He taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. You know, the scribes were those who were, who, who were given the task of literally sitting all day. And there was a, a process that they went through in the recording of the word of God. And, and recording it, and, and they, there were a certain number of letters on each page. They're going right to left. And as they're, they're writing it down, they're writing those things down, each line. They knew how many lines were on a page, knew how many letters across. They wrote it in just such a way that they could know if they had messed up in any form or fashion. If I've got too many letters when I get to the end of the line, I don't have enough. If something is wrong, this was supposed to be here. And so oftentimes what they would do, if they had in fact missed something, then they would make a scribal note. And they would, in fact, take that, all it up, put it in a canister, and bury it deep in the earth and start over <coughs> and get it right. No, no. These were those who knew the scriptures. They sat and recorded them all day long, every day. That was their job. And so when a scribe would teach, it was often as just hearing someone read scripture. But not the case with Jesus. When Jesus got up to read scripture, they knew something was different. He's the master teacher. What stood out differently? It says he taught as one having authority. As if he's the one who wrote this down himself and is now saying this. This is what you're going to do. This is from God. And God has sent me. And therefore, we have this in front of us. It is a wonderful thing when you think about Jesus as the master teacher. We see how he taught with parables. We see how he taught using just common things around him to illustrate, to make a point. But when he did so, the people got it. The common people heard him gladly. In fact, we learn from Mark's account of the gospel record. And so, to whom shall we go? If I want to be taught. I go to teach. I go to Christ himself and his word. This brings us then back to John chapter 6. When that question is asked, will you go away also? And it's time to make a commitment. Or to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. We understand that Peter was committed. We understand the apostles were, were committed to that teaching. But Jesus says, there's one even among you who is diabolical, who's going to betray me. Jesus knew what Judas Iscariot was going to do. But he allowed him to do it. Gave him a choice. He had free will. And so do we. So we too then have to make a choice. To whom will you go? Will it be to Christ as the captain of your salvation? The one who has made possible that way of salvation. Because he went to the cross. He died. He shed his blood for you. Glorious part of that is the fact that he was raised on the third day by the glory of the Father, by the power of the Father, brought forth from the grave. 
He lives. And He lives that we might also live for Him. What a great example He is for every child of God that we're to follow in His steps, Peter says. But we understand that He is the captain of our salvation. He has made that way possible. Do you believe Jesus then to be the Son of God? Would you repent of sin? Would you confess your faith in Christ? Would you be baptized to wash away your sins? Acts 22, 16. Calling on the name of the Lord. That is by His authority doing those very things. To whom will we go? If we can help or encourage you this morning, if you have a need, come to the front while we stand, while we sing this song.